Alright, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and this will be our sermon for the week. I've entitled it, The Romans Road. The Romans Road. Now, you either know what that is, or you don't. And so today, what I thought I'd do is I'd explain to you what this is. This is used a lot in modern Christianity. But what is it? Where does it come from? And, and why do so many people use it today? Uh, did the early apostles use the Romans Road method? Uh, well, that's what we're going to talk about today, but let's begin in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4, and then verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4, Paul says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, why God gave Paul the gospel to preach, and uh, he says God put him in trust with it. So he went and preached the gospel that God gave him. To be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. I find that interesting. He said, look, I'm, I'm preaching what the Bible says. I don't want to please you. I want to please God. And I feel the same way. I want to preach what God says in order to see people get saved, in order to please God. I'm not interested in pleasing men. I think it's more important to please God. But drop down there to verse 13, where it says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So the Apostle Paul was more interested in what God said than with what man said. And I find that quite interesting, and I believe that in the context of the gospel, it's important that we preach what God says, as far as the gospel, and not what man says. So I wanted to get that out of the way and read that first. Now, what we're going to do about today is we're going to talk about the Romans Road. The Romans Road is a method or a presentation that many churches give today of, of what they think is the gospel. And I look at that and I go, uh, what? And, and you look at many of the Romans Road methods that they give today, and you find out it's a little bit shallow. So we'll call this the Modern Romans Road. The Modern Romans Road Method. And maybe you've heard this in churches, and it has to do with soul winning, going out and winning people to Jesus. A lot of churches have whittled down the gospel. And they've whittled down the presentation of the gospel to just a couple of verses. And then they say, now pray after me. And so the Romans Road Method is usually just four verses, and that's all. And they think, well, we just go give somebody four verses, and then we say, now repeat after me, then they're saved. Is that enough? That's a good question. We'll look at that today. Uh, because of this Romans Road Method of just a couple of verses when you try to deal with someone, it's turned into what we call today the one, two, three, pray after me method. You ever heard of that? One, two, three, now pray after me. But is that biblical? Is that right? Is that the way that the early apostles won souls to Jesus? Did they go up to sinners and go, now let me show you three verses. Now look at this last one. Now repeat this prayer after me and you're saved. I don't see that. So I've looked long and hard uh, for finding out where does this Romans road come from. And I think I found it. But first, before I, before I get to the Romans Road and what it is and the verses that they use, uh, let me just say there is a tract that came out in the 60s by a man named Bill Bright. worked very closely with Billy Graham. And he wrote his little gospel tract, and he called it the Four Spiritual Laws. And in his little gospel tract, there's four points. Well, if you're a preacher, you know that most messages, you have three or four points. That's usually how a, a, a message goes in a church. Uh, they're taught what's called homiletics, and they're taught to preach a three-point or four-point homiletical outline. So what many have done today in Christianity is they've whittled down their presentation of the gospel of how to be saved to just three or four little points. And then they say, now just repeat this prayer. A lot of people call it the sinner's prayer. But are we saved by a prayer? Certainly you can pray. I'm not against prayer. But does the prayer itself save you? Well, a lot of people say yes. And the Bible doesn't concur. The Bible says we're saved by believing in something, not just by saying something with the mouth. So I've seen a lot of people use this Romans Road method, and I've seen, unfortunately, a lot of people not get saved by this method. Rather, rather they get indoctrinated and rather they get, uh, how would you explain it? They, they get, I hate to use the word, deceived. This was the method that I was presented as a young child. 
Uh, one, two, three, now pray after me. Pray this prayer. Repeat this prayer. And uh, I looked at that, and, and I used to get chick tracks. And I used to read them, and they had the little one, two, three, pray after me, Romans Road Method. And from age 13 to age 18, I would repeat the prayer every night, thinking, well, maybe the prayer will save me. And so I would do the little one, two, three, pray after me thing over and over and over again. But I wasn't saved, and there was a reason that I wasn't saved. It was because I had never heard the gospel in its entirety, and I had never understood that it's not what I do that saves me, or not what I say or pray. It's trusting in what Jesus did. So what I want to do today is I want to make it all about Jesus. Amen? A lot of people, they make it all about the soul winner instead of he that wins souls. And a lot of churches today, they use the Romans Road method of of trying to present to people a way of salvation and I don't know but to me I think that the Romans Road method is is kinda of shallow I hate to say it that way uh, there's a lot in the Bible now, obviously you can't teach somebody the entire Bible <laughs> in, in just a few minutes but there's a lot more that you can teach them than just the four verses that are now called the Romans Road method of salvation now who invented the Romans Road? How long has it been around? Well, I looked long and hard on the internet about that, and I came up with this. The Romans Road appears to have been coined by Jack Hiles. At least he has taken credit for coming up with this particular soul-winning method. From a sermon that was preached in Hammond, Indiana, on June 28, 1970. So, the Romans Road method goes back to the 70s, and maybe even 10, 20 years before that, based upon this quote by Mr. Hiles. Now, if you don't know who Jack Hiles is, Jack Hiles was a famous Baptist preacher in Indiana who boasted and claimed that he had the biggest Baptist church in the world. He hooked up with a man named Anderson and started what's called the Hiles Anderson College. And I've met Mr. Anderson, and um, he was a businessman, and, and from what I saw, uh, they took business method, you know, of a of a door-to-door -door salesman, excuse me, may I talk to you today and sell you this vacuum cleaner type type of mentality and and put that together with Christianity and that's what I see the Romans Road has become is a one, two, three, pray after me kind of a sales pitch to people. And that's kind of bothered me. Uh, yes, there are some good verses that they give, but like I said, sometimes I feel like you can go way more in detail and you should than just whittling down the presentation of the gospel to just a couple of verses. Okay, let me read what you uh, what this man says. Jack Kyle said in his uh, preaching message, "There remaineth yet much land to be possessed." That's the title of the message. Jack Kyle said in June 28, 1970. By the way, you folks who don't come on Wednesday night don't know this, but about 20 years ago in a little East Texas church, I came up with a little plan of presenting the plan of salvation called the Romans Road. So if that is true. He invented the Romans Road, the man named Jack Hiles. And it says, and show people how to be saved using Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, Romans 5.12, Romans 5.8, and on and on. So he only mentions four verses, but he had a couple more, it sounds like. I turned it, Mr. Hiles continues, the Romans Road, and from the Romans Road I wrote the little book, Let's Go Soul Winning. So this Romans Road... Um, plan of or method of presenting the gospel, the man who takes credit for that is a man named Jack Hiles. Now, I don't have time to get into Hiles and the independent Baptist movement and who they are. I wish I did. Um, in, in the world, there were Baptists. Let me get into it real quickly, a little detail, just so you get an idea. Um, all throughout the world, there have been Baptists. And uh, before the Civil War in America, they were always called Baptists, but they would say, I'm a Scottish Baptist because I'm from Scotland, or I'm a, uh, an English Baptist, or a Welsh Baptist, or I'm an American Baptist, or things like that. Well, the Civil War in America took place, and when the North and the South divided, so did the Baptists. And you had them calling themselves Northern Baptists in the North, and in the South they called themselves Southern Baptists. The North then split some more and turned into conservative Baptist and American Baptist. There's no such thing today as a Northern Baptist. They've, they've dropped that name and they call themselves conservative Baptist, American Baptist. Uh, are missionary Baptists also one of the Northern ones? I don't, I don't remember. But in the South, there was Southern Baptists. And to this day, there's Southern Baptists. But in about the 1930s or so, there was a famous Southern Baptist preacher named J. Frank Norris. And J. Frank Norris said, 
I don't like the way that the Southern Baptists are going because they had a famous school in Texas called Baylor University. And Baylor University began to preach and teach uh, the theory of evolution in their so-called Christian school. And so J. Frank Norris said, that's it. That's the last straw. We believe in creation. We believe in a literal seven days, six days of creation and the seventh day God rested. So this man, J. Frank Norris, has been credited with starting what we call today the Independent Baptist Movement. And for many years, the Independent Baptists have said, look, we are not like all the other cults. Matter of fact, the Baptist is the oldest denomination. There's a book by a man named Carroll, C-A-R-R-O-L-L, -L, uh, called... Um, uh, what is that book called? Uh, the Trail of Blood. If you ever get a chance, get that book by, by Carroll. Is it J.M. Carroll? I think it's J.M. Carroll. It might be H.B. Carroll. I, I always get those two guys confused. But a book called The Trail of Blood. And it shows how, as you go back in church history, you have the Catholic Church that always taught a different gospel. But you always had the believers in Paul and the believers in Christ and the believers in the blood who at first were called Anabaptists. That's what the Catholic Church called them because they said, we don't believe in infant baptism. That's not in the Bible. But you go back and you find names of them, the Waldenses, the Albigenses, the, the uh, many different names that were given, the Paulicians and Lollards and things like that. So God has always had his true witness of believers, and many of them tie back to the Baptist. Well, today we have what's called Independent Baptist because of J. Frank Norris. And I wish I had more time to get in and talk about him. He was an interesting fellow. Well, Jack Hiles claims to have been an independent Baptist. Now, after J. Frank Norris, there were a lot of Southern Baptists that left the Southern Baptist movement and became independent Baptists because they all said, I see the Southern Baptists going into apostasy on many levels. So one of them was a man named John R. Rice. Uh, you might know some of the others. Hyman Appleman was a famous uh, preacher and and Glenn Schunk and Peter Ruckman and, and uh, people like that. So the independent Baptist movement began probably in the 30s and 40s around that time and many people began coming out of the Southern Baptists and said no we're independent Baptists and that's what I am I'm an ordained independent Baptist believe it or not and what I like to say is we're completely independent of man see my faith is not in a man I don't have a Pope that I go to to ask permission to do things I'm independent of man but I'm completely dependent on God okay so I'm an independent Baptist uh, I'm independent of having a, some national synod or or a thing like that that tells me what to do but I follow God I'm dependent on him him well this John R. Rice um, knew this Jack Hiles fella and I find it interesting I've talked to a lot of older folks in the ministry Many of them are dying off that, that knew the independent Baptists of their day back in the 60s and 50s and 70s and, and all that. And anytime I meet one, I, I have lots of questions. I want to ask more. I want to know more about these guys. Because this is where the Romans Road came from. And uh, one told me that this man named John R. Rice, a famous independent Baptist preacher, um, someone told me that his last words before he died was, I've made a monster in Jack Hiles. Now what was he referring to? What was he mean? Why would he say that Jack Hiles was a monster? Well, I don't know, but I know around that time you start seeing the forming of this Romans Road method of salvation. And that's when you start to see this one, two, three, pray after me thing and what they call the hyper soul winning movement where people run around and they just use a couple of verses and that's all. So I'm not going to attack Hiles. I'm not going to attack his method. I'm going to present to you what it is I'm going to show you how, even though it's good to show people Bible verses, how I've seen in my ministry some people messed up because they're not getting the entire message. But there's a term that we use. I don't know if you've ever heard this term, TMI. <laughs> Have you ever heard of TMI? TMI. So a lot of times I'll, people will talk to me and they'll tell me something that I don't need to know. And so I go, stop right there, TMI. And they're like, TMI, what is that? Too much information. <laughs> Uh, you're giving me a little too much information. I don't want that. That's a little too much. So TMI is too much information. Well, when it comes to the Romans road method, to me, I think it's TLI. I think it's too little information. You know, there's a lot of good verses in the book of Romans. Why do they only choose these four and, and don't go to the other ones that are oftentimes better verses that are more clear and concise of how to be saved? So I think the Roman Rhodes method is, is too little information, to be honest with you. I don't believe in whittling down the gospel 
to just a couple of, of verses and then just saying, now, those are the only ones you can use. I've, I've actually heard uh, many of your uh, Hiles churches will hold what they call soul winning conventions or soul winning conferences. And they tell people, if you want to win someone to the Lord, you have to do it this way. You can only use this method. You can only do it the way we say. These verses, one, two, three, pray after me. I don't see that. I see that we should memorize the scripture. And that when we deal with a soul, we should let the Lord bring back from our mind the verses that that person needs to hear. And there are many, many, many verses in the Bible that we can use to try to win somebody to the Lord. We don't have to use just a certain list that a man, what, uh, 70 years ago, or let's see, is it 70? Yes, yeah, 70 years ago now, uh, said we have to use. No, I, when I win souls to the Lord, I'm flexible. I talk to people. I try to see where they're coming from, what they do believe, what they do understand. And I try to say, now, Lord, give me the verses to give that person. Sometimes they're in the book of Corinthians. Sometimes it's in the book of Philippians or Ephesians or Colossians. Sometimes it's from the book of Romans. But I don't follow a set method in which I say, now, you can only get saved this way, the way that I say, as men do. No, there's a lot. I got saved in the book of Romans, okay? Um, but... It wasn't one of the verses on the list. So what I'm trying to say is I think the Romans Road Method is TLI, too little information. I think we need to take more time with sinners and give them more scripture. And so what I want to do today is write up here what the modern uh, method of Romans Road is. And usually the Romans Road Method today is four verses. And they give you these four verses and they say, now only use these four verses and sometimes they differ, so I'm going to put and or or. Sometimes they'll start with Romans in chapter 3 and verse 23. That's usually the first one. Or they'll start with Romans 3.10. And they basically say the same thing, pretty much. So many, and, and a lot of these you'll find in a gospel track. A lot of these you'll find on a website. A lot of these you'll find ministers in churches going and they're preaching the method that was invented by a man and saying, use our method of soul winning. I'd rather use the Bible and just go to any verse that I believe the Lord would have me to give a soul to get saved. I don't think you have to use man's way of winning souls to the Lord. Do you, you see what I'm saying? So they usually start with that, and that's their first one. Okay. Then they go to Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Then they'll go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, or... Romans 5, 8. Both are which very good verses. Very good verses. But they both at least, both say about the same thing. So they'll, they'll either do that one or that one. Let me... Or Romans 5, 8. Okay? And then they almost always... Well, let me rephrase that. They always... This is what the main point is for these people. This is the one verse that they always want to get to. And that's supposed to be an arrow there. I don't know if there's... If it cut off on the edge there, but... Uh, this is the verse that they always want to get to, and they always want to go to Romans 10.13, and they always end on Romans 10.13, and so much so that it's like they're substituting the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. They're, they're, they're not going to that. They're going to this, and they're saying, now, this is the gospel. Yeah, but the gospel is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and many of the people that use the Romans Road Method, they never go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and I don't understand that. So let's look at these verses quickly and show you the verses that they give. And while I'm showing you their method, um, ask yourself, is this enough information for a person to get saved? The thing that I've seen a lot of people is that they'll, they'll do this, but they'll end up trusting in their prayer rather than trusting in the blood of Christ. And I've seen a lot of people go through the Romans method, and it goes so quick that the person prays the prayer, and then the guy goes, okay, now you're safe, goodbye, and walks away. And the person is left thinking, well, the prayer saved me. And then when the person is doubting if they're saved or not, or don't know if they're saved, then they say, well, what did that guy say? He said, say the prayer. Okay, I'm going to say the prayer over again. And then they keep this cycle of praying over and over, saying, oh, God, please save me. Oh, God, please save me. Oh, God, God, please save me. And they're thinking that they're asking or they're pleading or they're begging or their prayer is what saves them. So the Romans Road Method oftentimes tricks a person into trusting in their prayer rather than trusting in Jesus for salvation. So in other words, they're trusting in what they said rather than in what Jesus did for them. So again, I'm, I'm not going to attack the Romans Road method, but I am going to say, is it enough? Should we just whittle down our presentation to four verses and only use those? 
Or are there more verses, better verses, that we can use to win someone to the Lord? I think there are. And we'll get into those. But let me go through each one of these quickly. Romans 3, 23. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What a great statement. That is true. Every person in this world is a sinner. Verse 10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So these verses are used to say, You are a sinner. And that's pretty much what they're used for. And, and this is a man-made presentation of trying to lead a soul to Christ. So this is something that man made up using God's Word. I'm glad they're giving Bible verses, but when I look at it, I'm like, you're only giving so much. There's so much more that would make a better and more clear presentation of the Gospel. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Now let's go to Romans 6.23. So, Many people will come, and they've been indoctrinated in this method of trying to win souls, and they'll come to a soul and say, hey man, you know you're a sinner? Let me show you some verses. And they'll show them one of these two verses. And they go, you're a sinner, right? Are you a sinner? And usually a person goes, yeah, yeah, I'm a sinner. And they say, well, let me show you something. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so they say, so you're going to die. So they, they tell you, you, oops, I need to put it up here, you are gonna, I'm going to put gonna, die. So they talk about death, and they're all like, well, you know you're going to die someday? Do you know you're going to die? Do you realize that you're going to die, and the wages of sin is death? Do you, do you know what? And then they usually try to tie that into hell. Well, do you know where you're going when you die? Are you going to heaven, or are you going to hell? And that's good. I mean, people need to know they're sinners. People need to know that there is an afterlife, and you end up in one of two places. And then they say, now come over here with me to Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. And Romans 5, 6 says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And I say, Amen, that's awesome. Yes, Jesus died for us sinners. And then in verse 8, sometimes they'll use 8, sometimes they'll use 6, because they're very similar. They're both giving you the, the, the uh, idea that Jesus died for sin. Died for sins. And that's great. He did. Jesus did die for sins. And uh, verse 8 says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So they show that verse. They said, You realize Jesus died? Do you understand that Jesus died for our sins? Do you understand that? And a person goes, Well, yeah, yeah I, I get it. And they say, Okay, Romans 10, 13. Romans 10, 13. Come with me to Romans 10, 13. And they run over to Romans 10, 13, and they read it real quick. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right, now, if you call the Lord, now, will you just say, Oh, Lord, please save me. Oh, see you. Save me, Lord, please. Okay, you're saved. And they declare a person saved by their prayer. And so they tell the person to ask Jesus to save them. And you know, I've looked in the entire Bible, and I've not found one verse that tells us to ask God to save us. I've not found that verse because it's not in the Bible. They take the word call and they say that call means ask. Well, that, that's, that's two different words. They're two different. If you actually read the context of Romans 10, it's talking about calling from your heart. You know, I don't have time to read the context of Romans chapter 10, but it, it says the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in your heart. And uh, it says in another place, the word of faith, the word which is in thy heart, verse 8. So according to the Bible, it's, it's a heart thing, salvation is. And there's something from your heart. It's your heart that calls out to God by faith. It's your heart. But these people, many of them don't give that, don't show that, don't try to help people understand that. They focus more on the mouth, and they say, now, if you'll just with your mouth say, oh, God, save me. So they've turned salvation into something you do with your mouth. And say, now, if you'll just say, oh, God, save me, then he'll save you. So this is your one, two, three, now pray after me method. And I've seen a lot of people that claim to be Christians, they accept this method, and they use this method of trying to win souls to Christ. And it's a one, two, three, now repeat after me. One, two, three, repeat after me. And it's like, it, it becomes like so shallow and I've, I've been out knocking on doors with people that use this method. And it just baffles me how they can do this and think someone got saved from it. Because here's an example. I went out one time and a guy uh, knocked on a door and a guy's sitting there with a beer and he's drinking his beer. And he goes, yeah, what do you want? He goes, hey, let me show you some verses. Oh, Romans 3.23. Let me show you a verse. Romans 6. Let me show you Romans 5.8. Now, will you say this prayer after me and get saved? The guy goes, whatever you want, man, as long as it makes you get away faster. 
And the, and the man says, oh, Lord, I'm a sinner, please save me a minute. And the guy uh, takes his beer and says, oh, Lord, I'm a sinner, please save me a minute. And he goes, okay, now get out of here. And the preacher goes, well, I'm glad you're saved. Bye. And he walks away. And the guy's guggling his beer down as we walk away. And I'm scratching my head going, did that guy get saved? <laughs> he did what the little salesman told him to do. One, two, three, and he repeated the prayer. Was that guy saved? What if he repeated the prayer from his mouth only? But he didn't believe from his heart in Christ. Was he saved? Well, many soul winners walk away bragging on themselves and saying, I want him to Jesus, I want him to Jesus. Well, let's look at that guy. The whole rest of his life, he never goes to church, he never reads his Bible. He continues getting drunk and fornicating and living like the devil all the time. And, and there's no fruit of the Spirit in him. There's no change as far as on the inside, you know, the Holy Spirit inside, uh, showing him his error of his ways and, and him living for Jesus. You don't see that. So you look at that and you scratch your head and go, I don't think the guy got saved. All you did was just show him a couple verses and then get him to make a vain religious prayer. And now you claim he's saved? I just I look at this method and I say, this is a man-made method. Now, do you understand why uh, John R. Rice says I've made a monster out of Hiles? Because Hiles um, whittled the gospel down to just a couple verses. And so it makes me wonder, why, why would you only do these verses? Now, when I lead someone to the Lord, I always go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Usually I go there first because it's so wonderful. And it's the passage in the Bible that says, this is the gospel. So let's go there first. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, by which also you received, and wherein you stand. And I tell someone, look, the gospel is what saves us. And this is the gospel. You need to stand in this gospel. You need to make this your gospel and believe this and stand on this. It says, by which also you're saved. This is what you must take in order to be saved. You must accept by which also you're saved if you keep your memory about a preacher to you, unless you believed in vain. Vain is vanity, self. Don't believe in what you do. Believe in what Jesus did. Because the gospel is trusting in what Jesus did. Uh, a lot of people will go through this Romans Road method and then leave a sinner thinking they're saved because of what they said. And you're like, so that person thinks they deserve heaven because they repeated a prayer? Is that, is that Well, that's what they're saying. No, salvation is when we believe in what Jesus did. It's not what we did that saves us. But yet a lot of people have gone through this little one, two, three, pray after me. They say, I'm saved because I did this. And it's like, oh, no. Salvation is believing in what Jesus did for you, not what you do. I'm trusting in what he did. There's, there's a big difference there. So do you see how the Romans Road Method, although there are great verses there, is almost like TM, TLI, too, too little information. And if... Your, your whole point of giving that is not to get a person to come to Christ. It's to get them to repeat after you. Aren't you kind of like not getting them to Jesus? You're just trying to get them to repeat a prayer? Do you see that? I see that. Well, it says in verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the gospel is the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it's more than that. It says how Christ died. How did he die? He shed his blood. So, according to the Bible, it's all about the blood. And when I look at this one, two, three, pray after me, Romans Road method, I look at it and I go, you know, there's something left out of this that's, that should be there. You know what's left out? The blood. <laughs> so, when it comes to the Romans Road method, I like other verses in Romans. Other verses that, that I, I think are way clearer. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you these other verses from the book of Romans that I use. Because I do use uh, verses from Romans to win someone to the Lord. I do. Uh, somewhere around here I have a paper, I don't know if it's in my Bible or somewhere, of, of a list of 100 names that I've personally led to the Lord in my lifetime. I don't want to brag on myself. I want to brag on Jesus. Thank God I've had that opportunity. Thank you, Jesus, for the open door. And what I do is I take them to 1 Corinthians 15. I take them to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I take them to Acts 16, 30, 31. These are verses that I like to use. Uh, you don't have to only go to the book of Romans to try to win somebody to the Lord. 
there uh, are a lot of other verses in the Bible that are very good about how to be saved. So you don't have to just use certain verses from Romans. Okay? I want you to get a hold of that. These are some other verses that I like to use when I witness to people. But it's not wrong to go to these verses in your presentation, but don't only make it into these verses that in one, two, three, after, pray after me type of mentality. That, that's almost a cult. What does a cult do? A cult says you've got to do it this way. And this is the way we do it. Where's the liberty? The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. We're at liberty to witness to people and use any verse we want from the Bible. We don't have to do it in a man-made method, okay? Especially whittling it down to just a few verses and then pressuring someone to repeat after you. I think people, if they want to be saved, they should pray themselves and go to God and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, and I come to you for salvation, and I trust in what you did for salvation. It's not the prayer that saves them. It's them speaking from the heart and, and saying, I, I do trust, Lord. But I've met people who got saved that never prayed. When I got saved, I didn't pray. I heard the gospel presented for the first time in my life at age 18, yet I was in church most of the days of my life before that, and I never heard the gospel. I heard this a lot, but I hadn't heard the gospel. When I heard the gospel, my dad explained it. I believed it. And, and it was just like a light bulb went off of my head. And I was like, that's it. My dad said, when did you get saved? I said, now. Now I accept. Now I receive. Now I believe. I'm trusting in what Jesus did for me. He shed his blood for me. So the gospel is a blood-stained gospel, and it's all about the blood of Jesus. And a lot of methods that people use today, what's so sad to me is they leave out the blood. And what's sad about the Romans Road 1, 2, 3, repeat after me, is it's leaving out the blood of Jesus. Why would you do that? Now, Romans is a great book. There are a lot of good things in the book of Romans. So I say if you want to use the book of Romans to try to, and sometimes um, that might be all you have. There are uh, certain groups and Bible societies in the world today that uh, will print only a New Testament. And a lot of people will, will take a New Testament out and only use the New Testament to try to win someone to the Lord. Nothing wrong with that. But I'm seeing more and more churches that are printing John and Romans. And you might have one of those, and all you have is John and Romans. So you might want to win somebody to the Lord. Well, there's a lot of good verses in the book of John that you could use that will plant a seed. And then there's a lot of good verses in Romans. A lot of people have been saved from the book of Romans. I was saved from Romans 3.25, which we'll read here in a minute. Uh, Martin Luther, the famous Martin Luther, was saved by reading, I think it was Romans 5.1. Many, many people have been saved from verses from the book of Romans. But what's interesting is, they were other verses. They weren't any of these three, or four or five, or how many I have lifted up here. Uh, so, why do men make their own little method of trying to win souls and turn soul winning into a one, two, three, repeat after me thing? When there's a whole lot of other verses. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up here other verses. Verses that I use to win people to the Lord. I'll call these the other verses. Actually, I should call them better verses. Because <laughs> there's some better verses in the book of Romans that you can use than these over here. And the first one, of course, would be Romans 10. Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So Romans 10, 17 says that salvation is through faith, and our faith comes through hearing. All right, The more we hear, the more chance we have of believing. So why whittle it down to just three verses? The more verses, the better. And Romans 10, 13 says, Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Uh, another verse that, that is a good one here is Romans 1, 16. Romans 1, 16. And, and even Romans 2, 16. These are two of my favorites. Romans 1.16 and Romans 2.16. How are we saved? We're saved by believing the gospel. Well, the gospel isn't even mentioned in any of these verses. None of these verses that they say you need to hear mentions the term gospel. I just find that interesting. What does the Bible say? Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So we're saved by the gospel. It's great that you're showing verses about the gospel that mention part of the gospel, but none of those verses even use the word gospel. So there are other verses in the book of Romans that we can give people. Uh, Romans 2.16, Paul says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Well, there's the judgment. That's a good verse, talking to a sinner and say, Hey, you know, you're going to die, sure. 
But did you know someday you're going to be judged for your sin? I mean, what? why do we only use three or four verses when there's other verses we can use and we can give a more precise and clear uh, presentation of the gospel? So I believe in using more than just certain verses. Let's go to Romans 4. Here's a good verse. Romans 4. And this is important because a lot of people that you deal with today are what we call lost religious people. They might go to church, but they have a religion that teaches them that they're saved by works. And so what if you tell someone, hey, this, this, and this? They'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I heard Jesus died for people. Yeah, yeah you were all going to die. Yeah, I know I'm a sinner. But in their mind, they're going, but I go to this church, and I believe that if I do good, I'll go to heaven. And then they repeat a prayer. Are they saved? Not if they're still trusting in their own works to get them to heaven. Does the Bible say we're not saved by works? Of course it does. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Look at verse 5 through 8. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. And faith in what Jesus did. But notice faith. What is faith? Faith is believing. It's also trust. Trusting in something. So that's important. Where is faith over here? Do any of these verses mention faith? I, I don't see any. Um, they're, they're just trying to get you to say something with the mouth. But what if you say something with your mouth but your faith is not in what Jesus did for you. Are you saved? So do you see how the Romans Road method, it, it, it can lead to a person still being lost, even though they did something or said something? I want to give people as much information as possible. Let's go to Romans chapter 10, and verse 4. You know what you'll find? A lot of people will love to pray. A lot of people will pray after you. But the question is, are they trusting in their prayer that they say, are they trusting in Christ? That's the difference. Romans chapter 10 and verse 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Okay, so it's through belief that we're saved. We're no longer under the law. Works. We're not under works. We're not under, if you do this, then you'll get to heaven. That's not salvation. So the Bible says that we must have faith. Now, faith in what? Well, I was saved on Romans 3.25. So let's go over there. And the Bible gives the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, and the gospel is all about how Christ died, was buried, and rose again. And he did it for our sins. How did he do it for our sins? He shed his blood. So according to the gospel, it's a blood-stained gospel. Well, that over there looks like a bloodless gospel. Where's the blood in the Romans Road? Let me, let me uh, say this, too. Jack Hiles claims to have started the Romans Road. Jack Hiles hardly ever preached on the blood of Jesus in his ministry. I've met many people that went to Heil School. As a matter of fact, in uh, Central America, there was a, uh, a graduate of his, and I preached for him, and I preached on the blood. He's like, wow, that's good. I never heard that before. I'm like, you never, what now? <laughs> and uh, he gave me a book by Jack Hiles that he wrote, but it was published after Hiles died. Now figure that out. How do you write a book after you're dead? I don't know. Maybe he was writing it, and he died before it was able to be published, so they published after his death. And the book was called something like The Bride, The the Blood, no, The Book, The Blood, and The Bride. And I read his book. I read Jack Hiles' book on The Book, The Blood, and The Bride. And it almost sounded like he was confessing to have not preached hard enough on those three subjects. And that he wished if he could do it over in his ministry, he would have preached harder on the book, the King James Bible, and why King James only. He would have preached harder on the blood of Jesus because he left it out in many ways. And then he would have preached harder about the bride, the church, and things like that. So I, I look at that almost as a confession in his last days of, whoops, I left something out a lot in my ministry and in my little presentation method. <laughs> but what does the Bible say? Romans 3.25. Right? The Bible talks about the blood. And the Bible says that salvation is through faith. Well, faith in what? Romans 3.25. It says here, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Now, the word propitiation literally means the act of appeasing wrath. But the best way to explain it would be like a substitute. Jesus died in my place for my sins. Yeah, that's a good verse over here. That Christ died for the ungodly. He died in my place for my sins. He's my substitute. 
So I don't have to pay for my sins for all eternity. I can trust him who died in my place for my sins and who paid for my sins for me. So I come to Christ, and the Bible says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. How? Through faith in his blood. So how are we saved? We're saved by faith in his blood. So our faith should be in that blood of Jesus. Our, we should be believing in the blood. We should trust the blood of Jesus Christ for salvation. It's called the blood atonement. Where is faith in the blood in the Romans Road Method? I don't see it. Do you? So even the man who invented the Romans Road Method it wrote his book and was published after he died, which he confessed. You know, I didn't preach enough on the blood. I should have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should have. Why didn't you put Romans 3.25 in there? That, that would have been great, but you didn't. You have TLI, too little information. So Romans 3.25 is when I got saved, July 29th. About 10 o'clock in the morning, 1992, my dad took me through the scriptures and we came to this verse. It made total sense to me. Oh, we're saved by faith. And this tells me what my faith is to be and my faith is into the blood of Jesus. Why don't people give this? This is a great verse to go to when trying to win people to Lord. Why isn't it over here? Why isn't it in the Romans Road Method? Good question. Very good question. How about this one? Romans 5.11. Now this is a great verse. Romans 5.11. Salvation is by faith or by receiving. We receive I before E except after C. I got it right. Sometimes I get that backwards. We receive salvation through faith. And look what it says here in Romans 5.11. Why isn't this on the list of the Romans Road? Romans 5.11 says and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. We received what now? We receive the atonement. Well, this blood shed up here is called the blood atonement of Christ. And there's something that you need to receive in order to be saved. You need to receive the atonement. How do we receive that atonement on our behalf? How, how are we forgiven? Well, the Bible says we're forgiven by the blood of Jesus, and that when we're saved, we're washed in the blood. But how do we get washed in the blood? We receive the atonement through faith. So Romans 3.25 tells us that salvation is through faith in the blood. So if that's what the Bible teaches, then the Romans Road Method ought to include that. Faith in the blood and receiving the atonement. How? How do we receive it? By faith. And when you're saved, well, it says you get joy. So why isn't that in there? I don't know. Now there's another verse, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And some people will use this in their Romans Road method. And they'll put it in here. So that, but, but many don't. Many of them have whittled down the Romans Road to 1, 2, 3. Now pray after me. And that's why we call it the 1, 2, 3. Three, pray after me method. And I just look at that and I go, why don't you give like a whole bunch more? And why don't you say, hey, instead of praying after me, why don't you go to God and say, God, I, I am a sinner. And, and why don't you tell God whether or not you trust in his blood or not? Why don't you talk to God? Why don't you accept by faith the blood of Christ? That's better. That's better. Well, anyway, Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, let's read that quickly. 10, 9, and 10 says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, now watch the rest, the rest of it, and shalt believe in thine heart. Oh, okay, so there's a believing, and guess what? It's a heart matter. So you've got to believe from your heart. Well, there's the heart. So do you believe from your, I'm running out of room up here. <laughs> uh, well, let me put it right here. Do you believe from your heart? You know, there's a lot of people that, have prayed this prayer, but it wasn't from the heart. Matter of fact, it was somebody else's words that they repeated. Where was the repenting? Where was the change of mind? Where was the sorrow? Where was it, it being their, their own um, words? Why, why are they repeating someone else's? Is that from the heart? Just saying what someone else tells you to say? It makes me go, I don't know. So salvation is believing in thy heart. That thou shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now watch verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Okay, so belief is important. And believing in what? The blood. And it's from the heart. Why don't they mention that in the one, two, three, pray after me method? Why is that left out? 
And it says, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Yeah, well, uh, confession is saying what happened. So if you do believe in the blood, then you will confess. Well, I trust the blood. Well, it's not the confession itself that saves you. It's made unto salvation. After you're saved, you confess. Yeah, I'm saved. I believe in the blood. But a lot of people will twist that and try to change that and say, no, that means if you'll just say the prayer with your mouth, then you'll be saved. Yeah, but what if you say a prayer with your mouth that aren't even your own words from your own heart, that you're repeating someone else's words, and you don't believe in the blood? Are you saved? No, in that case, you are a false convert. And I have seen many, many false converts from this method. But in my 27, 28 years in the ministry, using this method of telling them about the blood, preaching the blood-stained gospel, I've seen a lot of true converts. I've seen a lot of my converts get saved and go out and serve the Lord and do something for Jesus. I've seen them know that they're on their way to heaven. I've seen them have joy. I've seen them happy. And I haven't seen them you know, going back into sin. But I've seen a lot of people that follow the one, two, three, pray after me method, and they're many. some of them are even atheists. Said, oh, I used to be a Christian, but I'm not anymore. And I say, well, tell me about it. What, what, what do you think made you a Christian? Well, one day some guy came to my door and showed me a couple verses and then said, pray after me. And so I became a Christian. I said, does the Bible say that? Well, he said so. He said I was a Christian because I did what he said. Yeah, he gave you his presentation. He didn't give you the Bible presentation. He gave you some good Bible verses that contain part of the gospel. But he didn't give you the entire gospel in its entirety and explain to you correctly that salvation is not just what you say or what you pray. It's not what you said. It's trusting in the blood that God shed. That's the difference. So I want to be a Christian who explains correctly the gospel and, and helps people to understand it's not you following me in a prayer. It's not me winning you. It's God wins you by faith. So my goal and my job is to give you as much information as I can about salvation, about the blood, about saved by believing and receiving the atonement, and giving you, and there's so many great verses in the book of Romans that they could read. And if they would just go there, they would see, hey, it's the blood. This is the stress that I try to give you. It's the blood, trust the blood. So do you see the difference? This side, it's, let me show you a couple of verses really fast because I'm in a hurry and I don't have time for you. One, two, three, now pray after me. And it's all about getting a person to do the prayer. And then you walk away. I've seen many, many people like this that follow this. They get a person to say a prayer. They go, okay, now you're saying bye-bye, and they walk away. And the person's like, bye-bye, duh. And that's all they know. All they've been taught is that you're saved by a prayer. And a lot of times that person is left trusting in the prayer, but they're not trusting in Christ. When I try to lead someone to the Lord, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to explain to them, hey, someone loved you enough to die for you and pay for your sins, and he cares about you, and he wants your complete faith and trust in him, in what he did, not what you do. <laughs> and he wants you to trust in him and his shed blood. And I believe that that is the right method of winning souls. Or Romans 5.1, therefore being justified by faith. So we're justified by faith. What is justified? Well, let me read the whole thing again. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the word is justified. I tell people, just if I'd. I, I, I divide that word up for people. And it's kind of fun to do that because in the English language, justified is being completely forgiven of all your sins. And when you trust the blood, it's just, well, better make it personal. When I trusted in the blood of Christ on July 29th, 1992, it was just if I'd never sinned. Because what I received was the imputed righteousness of Christ, as we saw in one of the verses. And, and I'm justified. I'm forgiven of my sins. So in God's eyes, I am now clean of all my sins. It's just if I'd never sinned. Oh, why don't they give that verse? And more. Let's go to Romans 5 9. How am I justified? Romans 5 9 says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. I'm justified by his blood. Justified by faith, justified by his blood. Well, don't you think it's important to mention that to a lost sinner that salvation is through the blood? Why would you use a bloodless man made method and leave out the blood? Well, 
let's go and I'll finish this up here. Romans 3, 24 through 28. Some of the best verses in the book of Romans, and yet they're left out. Left out. Now, Romans 3, 25 is the one I got saved on, but I love 24 and then the verses after. So let's read the whole context there. Romans 3, 24, being justified freely. Salvation is the free gift of God by faith. He gives it to you. You don't work for it. It's not what you do to get saved. It's receiving what Jesus has done for you and trusting in that to get saved. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. See how salvation is by believing in Jesus? It's not me doing this, or saying this, or repeating this that saves me. It's whether or not I'm trusting in Jesus. Well, sadly, because they go so fast in this little one, two, three, pray after me, a person's left going, well, I think I'm saved because I did what he said. I prayed the prayer, so I must be. I mean, he said so. What are they believing in? They're believing the words that the man said. No, I'm going to believe in the words that God said. I know I'm saved, not because some guy told me I got saved when I repeated a prayer. I know I'm saved because I'm trusting in the blood of Christ. To declare, I say, this time, His righteousness, verse 26, that He might be just, and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. Verse 27, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. It's not a work that we do. It's not words that we say that saves us. It's whether or not you are trusting in the finished work of Christ, His shed blood on the cross, are you trusting in what He did for you? That's what it all boils down to. And sadly, a lot of people who have followed the Romans Road method are trusting in what they did, or they said, or what some man told them, rather than trusting in what Jesus did for them. And I find that as atrocious. I find that as horrible. I just I look at that and I go, how sad. It's, do they have any spiritual discernment at all? Do you realize what you're trying to do when you're trying to win a soul? You're trying to win them to Jesus. And you're trying to point them to the blood of Christ as the only way of salvation. Because the Bible says it's through faith in that blood that you're saved. So when it comes to the Romans Road Method, um, you know, I'm glad there are people out there using the Bible and trying to show sinners how to be saved. But I'm also sad that they have taken the presentation of the gospel as so non-important and so not serious that they say, hey, just whittle it down to a couple of verses and then bring them to this and then just tell them do this and now they're saved because they did this. And it's just like, that's just too... That's, that's not... You're just making it a one, two, three, repeat after me and you're making it into some vain religious thing. Why don't you make it what it should be? Why don't you go to more verses? Why don't you take time to explain? Didn't Jesus said, uh, I believe he did, it was... Matthew 13, 15. Read Matthew 13, 15 sometime, where Jesus is talking about conversion or salvation and how a person has to hear and understand with their heart and be converted. There has to be some understanding. Okay? Does a person really understand with just a couple of verses and then a quick, now say this prayer? Is there any understanding? If we give more verses that are more powerful and, and explain more clearly, and then the person understands, then... Can they be saved? I think so. So it's been my experience, and you can listen to me or not. It's up to you. Make up your own mind. But it's been my experience that I chose in my ministry almost 28 years of not doing it the way man does it nowadays, a way that's only been around for about 70 years, invented by a guy who, after he died, printed his book in which he says, uh, whoops, I, I didn't really preach enough on the blood, and I kind of feel sorry for that. And rather than following men's way and the way men do it, I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go through and give as many verses as I can on how to be saved, on the importance of believing and faith. I'm going to go to other books rather than just Romans, but if I had like a John in Romans and nothing else, I could take a person to so many verses in the book of Romans that I could do my absolute best to show them, hey, it's the blood, it's the blood, it's the blood, and God demands faith. God says without faith it is impossible to please him. He says he wants your faith in his blood, Romans 3.25. So how about it? Are you saved? Are you trusting only in the shed blood of Jesus to get you to heaven? Are you a soul winner? 
do you use this method? Well, maybe you do. Maybe you say, well, Brother Breaker, I belong to a church that we, we use this method. We're instructed by our uh, pastor to use this method in soul winning. Okay. How about asking your pastor to watch this video? And how about saying, Pastor, can we deviate from the man-made, a little one, two, three, and can we give other verses? If we're going to use the book of Romans to win people to the Lord, can we use better verses that are more plain, that speak more about the blood rather than leaving out the blood? If your pastor is a spirit-filled man of God who loves God and the Bible and the blood of Jesus, he would be the first to say, yeah, yeah, let's make sure we mention the blood. But if, he, if he's a religious person who's a follower of man, he'll say, no, no, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way we're going to continue to do it. Be careful. I've met a lot of people that have been through this, and they're not even saved because they made a vain religious prayer with their mouth saying what some guy told them to say, but they're not trusting in the blood for salvation. And I find that really sad. So I wanted to make that clear today. I'm not attacking anyone. I'm not putting them down. Uh, I'm just explaining, uh, well, the truth. <laughs> And, and historically, this came from uh, that guy. And this is a method that has been around for about 70 years that people use. But that method leaves out the blood. So if you're going to go to Romans Road, let's make a Romans Road that has more verses from Romans that are more clear and explain, hey, the gospel is all about the blood, and you need to believe the gospel, and it's the blood that saves. You need to accept the blood, accept the atonement, and it's by faith in the blood. And let's make it as clear as we can. Souls are at stake, people. Eternity is real. And people are going to die and go to hell if they're not trusting in the blood atonement of Christ. So let's make sure we give a clear, plain presentation of the gospel. And not some watered-down version of it, of just a couple of verses, and then pray after me. All right, God bless.